Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Al Rain. Uh, I'm National TOD Director for AECOM. I'm on the uh, MPAC National Steering Committee, and uh, I'm both the coordinator of this session uh, and the moderator and a participant. And we have a terrific panel, a really terrific panel, that I'll introduce you to in a moment. Um, but I, uh, I want to begin by introducing uh, the topic and by telling you how we're going to conduct the session. Uh, we're going to do this in three segments. Uh, the first is going to be brief presentations from all of us, uh, kind of teeing up what it is uh, we want to talk about, the particular case studies that we want to bring to your attention. Uh, these will be briefer than typical conference presentations because we're going to have two segments after that. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion that I'll moderate uh, with all of us uh, speaking to each other on a list of questions that we've given some thought to, uh, and then we'll leave plenty of time for traditional audience Q&A. By the time we come to that, you'll have heard the deeper discussion, and your questions uh, can be particularly focused, if you're so inclined. Um, let me talk about the panel, uh, and then we'll get to the idea. Uh, as I said, I'm the moderator. Uh, my name is Al Rain. Uh, a long time ago in my youth, uh, I was the chief planning and development officer in Massachusetts uh, and had a great deal to do with the MBTA and the early emergence of TOD and joint development in Greater Boston. And for a time after that, I was the CEO of the Massachusetts Port Authority, uh, which is specifically relevant to uh, one of the things I want to tell you about the MBTA. Uh, to my immediate left is Jack Rosensky. Uh, the Assistant Vice President for Economic Development at Dallas Area Rapid Transit, or DOT, as we say in Boston. Um, we do say it that way in Boston, and there's no other way I can pronounce it. Uh, Jack is the principal, he's, he's the TOD guy, and Jack is the principal point of contact uh, for DOT with both the development community uh, and the authorities, uh, many member municipalities. Uh, he has been there. He's been at DOT since 1991, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, and he's been on the National Steering Committee of Rail Evolution, now IMPACT, since 1997. So uh, he's, uh, he knows more about this stuff than any of us. To Jack's left is Sherry Ziller. Uh, she is the president and CEO of the Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority, and you'll hear all about that and, 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 and why they're represented here in a discussion uh, of joint development. Uh, she's been with the Regional Development Authority since its inception. The Indiana legislature created it in 2005. Uh, they opened the doors in 06, and Sherry's uh, been there that whole time, most recently as CEO. And their mission, their, their mission is very broad, but their mission with respect to transit-oriented development is to enhance the connection to Chicago uh, by a commuter rail uh, and to enhance job creation and maximize economic development. And among many other things, because she runs the whole place, uh, she's the person in charge of that. Uh, and to her left is Shannon Price. Uh, who's the Executive Director of Integrated Development in the British Columbia uh, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, broadly analogous uh, in, in concept, but really, really not in what they do, uh, to a state DOT uh, here in the U.S. Uh, Shannon had 25 years uh, as a real estate development professional in the private sector, and she is now the person in charge of a new and very exciting uh, joint development program uh, at the ministry that, that she will tell you about. Um, in addition to who we are as individuals, uh, I try to pick a panel that represented uh, not only a geographic diversity from not only different parts of the U.S., but, but from... from, from uh, British Columbia as well, um, but representing different kinds of, 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 of public jurisdictions uh, for reasons that I'll talk about in a second, the, the theme of, of, of this session. Um, two of us, Jack and myself, represent uh, traditional transit agencies uh, in the U.S. Dot in Jack's case, I don't in any way want to suggest that I'm representing the MBTA, uh, don't work for them, but I've got a long professional uh, association with them, uh, not to mention having ridden the MBTA more days than not since the 1950s. Uh, we have a regional economic development authority with a close 
uh, jurisdictional relationship uh, to a commuter rail uh, operating agency. Uh, that's, that's Sherry. Uh, and we have, as I said earlier, uh, the Canadian equivalent of a state DOT uh, that, has, that has stepped into, been invited by its legislature to step into the TOD business in a very direct kind of way. I, I want to say now, and, and we'll come back to it in, in the Q&A, um, that although you're going to hear mostly examples uh, of, of rail t involving different kinds of rail transit, uh, the, 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 my, my MBTA thing will include one example about BRT, but you're going to hear mostly about rail transit examples, but I want to emphasize that the idea that we're here to talk about, uh, this big idea of jurisdictional partnerships and joint development, is in no way limited uh, to rail transit systems or rail transit agencies, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to do a, a session about it uh, and, and, and bring these ideas to people's attention. So what, the big idea we're talking about, that joint development's not a big idea, you all know about that, but there's a particular way of looking at it uh, that we want to spend some time talking about today. Um, there's a guide to joint development for public transportation agencies uh, that uh, uh, the TRB published a couple of years ago. Uh, I had the privilege of being the lead author of that. And one of the main things we try to do in that, like on page one, was to set forth a definition of joint development that could become an industry standard so that when we say joint development, we all mean roughly the same thing. And we all understand joint development's a subset of, of TOD. Uh, a lot of TOD happens, most TOD happens that isn't joint development at all. But the definition we used is that it's real estate development that happens either on transit agency property, and usually when you think about joint development, that's what you're thinking of, or, uh, and the or is bold, underlined, and italicized, through some other kind of, of, of development transaction to which the transit agency or the transit property is a party uh, and, 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 and gets some benefit out of. And, you know, why, why do public agencies, either transit agencies or other agencies uh, that have some direct stake uh, in, a, in, a, in a transit asset, why, you know, so what? Why do they care about joint development? And when you talk to them, there are always three reasons uh, in one order or another. Uh, to grow ridership uh, and, 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 and fare box revenue uh, by, you know, by, by virtue of the TOD aspect of this, but you get that from any TOD. Um, to uh, To financially support transit, and obviously ridership and fare box revenue supports transit, but in a joint development deal, there's something else. There's revenue, there's some kind of in-kind contribution by somebody. There is something of a quantifiable nature besides ridership and fare box that it's the transit agency gets. And thirdly, joint development is the opportunity to set the standard in a particular station, area, or corridor for what it is you, as the, as, as the transit interest, would like to see there to be a catalyst and to be an exemplar. So, uh, joint development is a jigsaw puzzle. It's why it's fun. And it's a jigsaw puzzle with four complicated pieces that are, that are puzzles in themselves. There's the spatial aspect of it. How do the pieces fit together physically and sequentially? Uh, you have to face that in any complicated joint development project. There's the jurisdictional aspect, which is what we're going to focus on today. What public entities are involved in this, in this project or transaction, and how are they involved? There's the transactional roles and responsibilities. Who owns what, who builds what, who operates what, who pays for what, and who gets what out of, out of the deal. And, and, and hopefully, there's a transformational aspect, at least, at least aspirationally, that a well-done joint development project can, can achieve that third reason that I had on the previous slide, that it can really move the needle, be catalytic, pick your cliche, of, of what's going to happen around a particular station or corridor. And as I said, we're going to focus on the jurisdictional aspect, but it very, you know, very self-evidently involves all of the other puzzle pieces as well. So when we talk about jurisdictional partnerships, at least in this session, uh, I, I mean a particular thing. Um, it's a variety of ways in which a transit agency or some other agency, as is, as is the case in a couple of these examples, uh, with a direct stake in a transit property, can work with other jurisdictions to do things that the transit property itself couldn't do. And when you talk about joint development, one of the things you 
always hopefully do, that's a jurisdictional partnership in a sense, is work closely with the city or the county or whoever the local land use authority is to get everything lined up and supported. That's critical. If you don't do that, you'll fail. But that's actually not what we mean today. We mean some particular inclusion of other jurisdictional partners in a deal that allows joint development that otherwise might not occur. Why? Because the transit agency doesn't own land, because the transit agency doesn't have resources or the legal enablement uh, to do what you have to do to carry out joint development, because the culture or the expectation of that agency, uh, you know, isn't that it will be a, 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 a force and a sponsor in joint development. Whatever the reason is, one of the ways that the opportunity for joint development and for the, those three benefits that we talked about to be broadened is to figure out how to get some other public jurisdiction or jurisdictions into the deal. And we want to talk about four examples of that today. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the system that I've ridden all my life. And with these blinding lights, I can't see if there, there are any friends from Boston here or not. If you said, if you said to anybody in Boston, well, the MBTA is a multi-jurisdictional pioneer, they, you know, they, they think I was on drugs. But you look at it over time. The MBTA does a, a fair amount of joint development. And I'm going to give you five headlines from five consecutive decades in which the T has done something, been part of some deal in which the jurisdictional partnership idea that we're talking about uh, has actually come to pass with success. I'm just going to blast through these as headlines. But in the 1970s, the South Station uh, was saved from the wrecking ball and spectacularly redeveloped. That great big tower coming out of the headhouse is actually being built now after all this time. But the MBTA agreed to become, in old-fashioned urban renewal terminology, the designated developer for the Boston Redevelopment Authority, which, which, which owned the land in the old historic state house. And this layer cake of ownership relationships between the MBTA and the Boston Redevelopment Authority was created and it's held to this day, which is, which is how you see a skyscraper uh, coming out of, of, of the top of the station. <coughs> In the 1980s, um, a new corridor, a new heavy rail, both metro and commuter rail corridor, <coughs> and track as well for that matter, uh, the Southwest Corridor which runs through several Boston neighborhoods opened and there was a spectacular opportunity in terms of available land. There was a spectacular opportunity to do a lot of TOD and joint development, but the land ownership for historic reasons was balkanized among the MBTA, the State Highway Department, the city proper and the redevelopment authority. And we all wound up agreeing that everybody, including the T, would merge their land holdings uh, to create a big development parcel and that the Boston Redevelopment Authority, which knows how to do this stuff, knew how to do it then, the MBTA had no idea, would be the agent for everybody else. And at the end of the day, each, you know, each, each landowner would get their piece of the proceeds, but all of the development activity would be, would be consolidated into the BRA, and it worked. Um, in the 1980s, um, the, I'm sorry, in the 1990s, uh, we started working on it in the 80s, um, our spectacular South Boston waterfront, which you now call the Seaport District, emerged, and it's, it's organized around a bus rapid transit subway, the Silver Line, and the Massachusetts Port Authority, which I ran, uh, which is the principal landowner there, donated the right-of-way for that segment and the rights-of-way for two big stations uh, to the MBTA. And, 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 and also wound up sharing the cost of the bus fleet as well, because it serves both this, this land area which Massport owns and goes on to Logan Airport, which Massport owns. And uh, the results are really as good as they look in that, in that top picture. Um, in the 2000s, there's a very famous project called Assembly Square in which a developer, a combination of the developer and the State Economic Development Agency teamed up to create a $56 million brand new infill station on the Orange Line, which was free, zero, to the MBTA, um, or now a pre-pandemic, about 6,000 riders a day, um, from a very, very large, one of the largest in the Northeast, brand new uh, transit-oriented development districts. And lastly, um, in this last decade, uh, the T committed itself in earnest 
to the extension of our light rail green line into the city of Somerville and the key downtown station there uh, is Union Square and in a arrangement similar to what I described on, on, the, in, on the waterfront, the Somerville Redevelopment Authority, traditional redevelopment authority, assembled this big site for a big mixed-use joint development uh, uh, program and donated the right-of-way for the station uh, to the MBTA and between the right-of-way and shared costs in the station facility, <laughs> save the T a fortune. So there are five examples uh, over five decades in which the MBTA has figured out, uh, in some cases been told to do it, and in some cases figured out themselves to combine with other jurisdictions to do stuff they could not do or could not do nearly as efficiently themselves. So, with that as both context and uh, a first example, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I'm going to uh, turn this over to our next speaker, who will be Jack Rosensky. And uh, Jack, take it away. <coughs> okay. I'm hoping I get. Oh, oh. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Well, we'll forget about the first slide. Um, I just want to get a little overview. Um, I'm going to focus on partnerships, and as Al teed it up, on jurisdictional partnerships. Um, I'm not going to talk about partnerships with developers because I think those of you who've worked on projects like this know that developers will be your best friend until you select them and start negotiating. And then all at once things change quickly. So I'm, I'm going to focus on our... Uh, our uh, service area here is a 700 square mile service area, which makes up DART, um, <clears throat> and 92 miles of light rail, which it used to always be the cool thing to say that we're the largest uh, light rail system in North America, but not so much anymore. Now, now we've got a great bus system and we're making it efficient, and secure, and safe. And uh, as part of, uh, of what we've been doing, uh, over the years, and Al touched on uh, parking, and I just came from a parking session uh, uh, previous to this, but really what, what has driven us in TOD over the years is the ultimate opportunity to start developing on the DART property. DART has about 350 acres of property tied up in parking lots and service facilities, and, and some vacant property even that had been acquired as part of uh, rail station development. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, my throat is really hashed here today. So a couple of us are suffering. I think it's from the traveling. Uh, uh, so what we, we were really focused in the early years of partnering with developers on developing around DART's properties and working with our member cities, which uh, a lot, thanks, a lot, of, a lot of the issue uh, was really uh, a lot, we've got 13 member cities and there was a different learning curve for every city on, on the, the possibilities of, of light rail. And it really took uh, the developers, the first two developers of Mockingbird Station and uh, Southside on Lamar and Matthew Southwest were two major TODs that opened up in 99 and then uh, 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 the, the interesting thing is it was the suburbs that really caught on to it, uh, Plano and Richardson. Uh, City of Dallas was one, probably one of the last ones, but then they got into it in a big way. Um, <clears throat> and one thing, uh, just as a, a precursor to all of this discussion, is that um, with the cities it, uh, versus DART, DART's a transit agency. We focus on transit every day. The cities, uh, particularly the planning departments, they've got many things on their plate. So they, there's nobody there that just focuses on TOD. They've got so many things going on right now. Uh, we, in parking, we were, we've been talking about minimum parking. Uh, the city of Dallas is trying to uh, uh, see if they can uh, make that happen in the city. So, uh, and we're working with them on that also. So. Uh, it's just, it's, it's the priorities and how do we attract the cities to work with us. And as I, I start moving down the line here, you'll see. The first thing we did, and this is something that I'm always surprised, uh, having done this for so long, um, <clears throat> that a lot of transit agencies don't have policies 
or if they do have a policy, it's like 20 pages and it's really more process and procedures. We did, we've worked with our board and we've uh, modified this three times over the last 20 years. Uh, this is the most recent, was updated in um, 2020. And you'll see at the very top, one of the number one most important thing is foster cooperative relationships with other governmental entities. Because uh, there are a lot of things uh, within DART's labeling legislation uh, which is very limiting to us, particularly when it comes to development. Um, <clears throat> DART does not have the power to condemn. Uh, we're required to get fair market value when we sell our property. Uh, we, as I think most everybody does, we have to go out to uh, solicitation. So we, we have uh, several things that, uh, and, and part of the fair market value is, uh, which I've been hearing a lot in other sessions, is uh, some transit agencies can actually uh, discount land uh, for uses. That's something that, uh, one is uh, within our local government code we can't do in the state, but the other is our board of directors is looking how to make money off these projects. Uh, and not subsidized projects. So, uh, <clears throat> the, the, and the, the second bullet is also important, it's, and the board is very supportive of this, is reallocating surface parking spaces. And that's where really, really uh, what precipitated a lot of this, is over the years, before COVID, DART has 25,000 parking spaces uh, in the system with both uh, stations and bus transit centers. Uh, of the 25,000 spaces before COVID, we were only parking about 48% of them. Uh, since COVID, it's now down to about 5%. Uh, and, and that's just over this last quarter. We inventory our parking spaces every quarter. So we keep up on it and we've been able to monitor this over the years. <clears throat> uh, so uh, the, the big impact, the big uh, take home with my presentation today is uh, how, how we've gone about working with our cities uh, on moving forward with a lot of these TODs. Um, <clears throat> right now we've got 12 TODs that are what I would call in the hopper that are moving forward with our cities. Um, the first two that we did, uh, and I'll show you an example of it, one of them is we did the traditional way of doing uh, 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 calls for projects, RFPs, where DART went out on its own with an RFP, and of course we bring the, effect, the affected member city in, into it as part of the process, <clears throat> but DART led the process. We went out in 2016 and 17 with two RFPs. We selected developers through that process, and we're working through them uh, right now. Uh, I'll show you a slide of one where we've already executed uh, development agreements and we're getting ready to go to construction here over the next year. Uh, however, uh, as part of these processes, those started in 2016 and actually we had an RFP in 2005, uh, which we selected a developer and then of course, as luck would have it, in 2009 was the recession and the developer dropped out. Uh, so, with the, our, our member cities uh, started talking to us about and proposed the idea that they could do it a lot faster than DART. DART is such a bureaucracy. We're not focused on development anyway. You know, we're moving people. Development is something that we do on the side, basically. And so is there a better way of doing this? And they came up with the idea that how about we, the, uh, each city, develop a TOD plan uh, and then we, and we'll do the public process and we'll get it rezoned. Then uh, we will come to you and exercise an interlocal agreement which allows us to lease the property from you. And then we will lead an RFP process and selection process with you all in partnership, but in this case we'll lead it, select a developer, and then sub, we'll sublease the property to the developer. And as part of that, what DART does or uh, has done is we set the, <clears throat> the lease terms, uh, financial lease terms, the rent terms, uh, within the ILA also, so that uh, it cuts down on the time of negotiation. Um, and then uh, as a spinoff of that, uh, about uh, 2020, right before the pandemic, uh, the city, a couple of cities came forward to us 
and talked about just partnering with them on TODs to go out and see what they could do. One of them had a developer building next door to one of our transit centers. And so uh, they asked if we could exercise an MOU, which is a memorandum of understanding, which uh, initiates this process, but doesn't start the zoning or the TOD uh, planning. So the, the difference is an ILA has a TOD plan that when we exercise it, we go through the board and when we review it with the board, there's an existing plan there that they can give their thumbs up on or not. And with an MOU, part of that is developing the plan. And then the idea is once the plan is developed, uh, the city moves forward, goes out with an RFP, selects a developer, and then the developer will either finalize the plan or the city can uh, get the zoning beforehand on it. So uh, just a couple examples of some projects here. This is Mockingbird Station. This is the one we did, the RFP, uh, and we let it on our own. It's an 11-acre pro pro uh, property. <clears throat> it's mixed use in the back where the residential is. That first phase one is a residential office tower, as well as phase one is an underground garage for, par for DART parking. We've reduced our parking here from 720 spaces to 500 spaces. So one thing in working with our cities also is it, we, they have been very cooperative in reducing parking. Uh, and and I, again, a lot of them have already incorporated into their TOD ordinances. And so uh, it's, it's really um, joining together and, and moving forward with these projects. Uh, this is the concept, uh, and we are gonna be briefing the board on this in a week. The initial uh, parking garage was going to be underneath the bus facility, but due to uh, utility issues, there's a major transmission line there uh, over where the underground garage would have been. Uh, it became cost prohibitive and time prohibitive, so we're moving it to uh, behind uh, uh, towards uh, the middle of the under the uh, office tower there on the front parking lot. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so that'll be a 500 space parking garage and we will have technology to charge for parking as well as monitor uh, vacant parking spaces as it goes along. So the TOD agreements, I, I went through a lot of the uh, guidelines with you, but here I think these uh, presentations will be made available to you. But the big one is that the lease requirements are defined up front and as part of the ILA. Uh, one thing we found what takes a lot of time particularly internally with DART is the negotiation of lease terms. Everybody's got an opinion of what should be in the lease. And so uh, this has really helped out and we're trying to even streamline it more as we go along. Um, and the DART, uh, the DART board approved uh, two ILAs, uh, yeah, I've got some pictures of the projects coming up here, with uh, Richardson and Addison in uh, June of 2021. And keep in mind that was right in the midst of all the uh, pandemic issues. So uh, we still made a lot of progress on these. This is the Addison project uh, on the lower left uh, where the orange buildings are. That is DART property there. And it's reflected in the right hand picture of our property. It's about six and a half acres. It's an active transit center, although well under parked again. Uh, and uh, an old building that is there. So uh, the developers uh, have moved forward on that. Uh, however, the office developer just dropped out a month ago. So the city of Addison is looking to, to replace them. And as you all know, and has been discussed the last couple of days, the office markets and the lending and, and uh, interest rates are all uh, creating quite an impact on TOD development right now. Uh, Richardson is a 14 acre uh, DART uh, park and ride site originally, which a uh, rail station was put in next to it. Um, we only park out of 1,200 spaces. We park on a good day before COVID 400 spaces. So a lot of land for development here. The city uh, developed a, a uh, let's see, did I put my note? Oh, and, and the upper right corner, I didn't want to miss the, the TOD plan that they did. Uh, they created an innovation district in this whole area. It's, it's uh, uh, fairly large, it goes well beyond the DART station. But the DART station was really the centroid of that project. And so they came in, the DART, the DART board was very supportive. We exercised a uh, uh, <clears throat> ILA with them. They went out with an RFP about a year and a half ago. However, they weren't successful 
with it because, because of some of the terms we've gone ahead. We revised the terms in the ILA, and they'll be going back out next spring with another um, <clears throat> RFP. Uh, and then MOUs uh, is, again, just to get the basic understanding, get the city to work on TOD planning. Uh, the unique thing here is with the city of DART, we selected six stations. This is packaged up as six separate stations, all that had good potential for TOD development. Uh, we, we, again, partnered with the city, uh, went out with an RFP a, a year and a half ago. Uh, developers were selected in June. And uh, we are now just uh, starting to meet with each of the selected developers on starting to re refine their TOD plans. Part of that will be then public engagement and zoning, which will be led by the city and partnered with the developer on that. Uh, and then lastly, just a, a quick flashback on the parking issue. Garland was the one that really brought this up. They've got two stations and two bus transit centers, all of them well under park. Uh, South Garland Bus Transit Center on the bottom right, uh, 603 spaces altogether. Right now it's parking about 10 cars a day there. Uh, the Lake Ray Hubbard, the other uh, transit center, 557 spaces, it's parking about 50 cars a day there right now. So these, these had a lot of potential. The city was really excited about working with us on. So we, the board was very supportive to move forward with that. Uh, here's the concept for Lake Ray Hubbard. They've done the uh, uh, concept with a developer, or not a developer, with a consulting firm. And then the next step will be to go out with an RFP to uh, select a developer on this and negotiate it and move forward with the construction. The real impetus was that for this was in the aerial photo on the lower left. You see that big green space there, the big green square. That was property owned by Walmart. It was going to be a uh, Walmart to go in there in the future. There's a Sam's Club on the right next door to it. They decided instead to uh, bring on a developer to uh, develop that site. They just broke ground on development on that site in September. And so part of that was the city asking us if we'd be agreeable to uh, master plan that whole site for TOD, which the city went ahead and did. And so that will be moving forward again with an RFP this spring, probably. Um, and then the last concept we've got with the South Garland Transit Center, and again, that's the one that's parking 10 cars a day. Uh, however, the bus transit center is very active. So what we're looking at, the city owns the, the property in the middle there on the, the red and the blue, the city of Garland own. The blue site, DART rented a, for a dollar a year. And uh, for parking, it used to be the red site was the Cinemark Movie Theater. And so we were used for the shared parking for that. City since bought that, tore it down. And then the dark parking is in the green below there. So we'll be putting that out a lot. Well, the city's moving forward on that. We'll be doing uh, an ILA with them and putting that out uh, for development potential sometime in the next year. So I think uh, I probably went way over my eight minutes, Al. Sorry about that. But, uh, <clears throat> but we'll get into the next phase, question phase coming up. But next, turn it over to Jerry. Jerry. Good afternoon, everyone. Very thrilled to be with you all today. Such an honor to be presenting uh, to you all. Uh, I'm Sherry Ziller. I'm the president and CEO at the Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority. So really quick, thank you to Impact and especially Al Rain for the opportunity to come here today to share with you what's going on in our section of the country, which would be um, Northwest Indiana. And I know for many of you that uh, are here today that you do come from very large, well-established uh, transit systems. So what we're doing in Northwest Indiana might seem uh, a bit modest, and that's okay if it does. Uh, but for us, it's going to be uh, a very significant transformative change for what we affectionately call the region. And when we tell our story, which we're always happy to do, sometimes people say to us that, wow, Northwest Indiana, you are really punching above your weight class. 
So I thought it would be good to start off with who we are, what have we done, why were we even created in the first place. So the Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority, we were established in 2006 by the Indiana State Legislature, like Al was saying. We have the goal of addressing the big infrastructure projects that would have a significant regional uh, impact in Northwest Indiana, but was really too large for any one single municipality to deal with. So for our first decade, we had an annual budget uh, of 27 and a half million, 17.5 of that came from our local sources. And then as you could see on here, we also had 10 million dedicated from the state annually. And what we would do is we would provide our communities of Lake and Porter counties. So those are our two most northwesterly counties in uh, Indiana. And it would usually be in the form of a dollar for dollar matching grant. Not always, but a lot of the times it was. And if you ever want to see the results of that, you know, come to Northwest Indiana, see our Lake Michigan shoreline. We had nearly abandoned parks, we had gravel lots. It was really an industrial uh, dumping ground. It's all been restored now, 55 miles of shoreline to dune and swale and sandy beaches, bordering uh, the beautiful Lake Michigan. So, so that was the work we, we did the first 10 years and, and we did make Northwest Indiana a much nicer and more attractive place to live there were still some very fundamental um, issues that remained. So we started looking at some things I'm gonna talk about in a second, about a decade ago, and this is how we actually developed our business case, if you will, to get all the funding for our rail projects that we have. So uh, as many of the other uh, sessions talked about, so we looked at population. Northwest Indiana, we're part of the Chicago MSA. So as you can see on this, uh, Chicago's population had grown and Northwest Indiana's was stagnant. And then we started looking at income. I'm not sure how well you could see this. It looks like it's showing up pretty good, but green is good, red is bad. All those areas in the lower right-hand corner, that's us, that's Northwest Indiana. So relative to the rest of Chicago, the Northwest Indiana region was really lagging badly in both population growth and income. So we started asking the question, why was that happening? And one easy to identify reason was that lack of connectivity to Chicago. So, you know, you could hop in your car, you could drive to your job in Chicago, but anyone that uh, is familiar with Chicago or any other uh, places similar, you have long commute times and it's just the parking is hideously expensive. And then Chicago also has a very sophisticated suburban and city bus service. Northwest Indiana, we have four buses, not, not bus service, we have four buses. Uh, that's our Chicago Dash bus system. It transports commuters in and out of the Chicago Loop for, for their jobs. Uh, and then you have uh, on the map the South Shore, which is above Lake and Porter County, and as you can see, just completely outclassed by Metra. So then we started thinking about the solution and little old Northwest Indiana had the crazy idea that we could compete with, you know, the big uh, boys in the room, literally in the room for, for federal funding. And that's exactly what we did. We said, all right, we are going to expand commuter rail. And that took the form of two projects. We have the Westlake Corridor, that's the first extension in the South Shoreline's history. And then we have Double Track, which as the name suggests, it involves double tracking the existing line all the way to Michigan City and LaPorte County. So that's another county that the RDA is able to work with. And then the projects are being funded by a combination of RDA revenues. We have contributions from 14 of our local communities out of their local economic development funds, significant support from the state of Indiana itself, which at that point 
at that point in time had been uh, quite unheard of. And then of course, part of the funding, a major part of that were the federal matching dollars. So all in, all told, we are talking about roughly a $1.5 billion investment. And it is the largest economic development project and infrastructure project, not just in Northwest Indiana, but in the uh, entire history of the state of Indiana. So I just wanna talk a minute or two about how the project is governed. Uh, so the project itself is governed by an agreement between my agency, the RDA, and the transit rail operator, so uh, Northern Indiana Commuter Transportation District, that's NICD, and then the state through the Indiana Finance Authority. So NICD is the recipient of the federal funds. They actually build the projects. RDA. We are in charge of funding from our own sources, and we also act as the state's fiscal agent, and then the state itself is providing direct cash support, and then through the Indiana Finance Authority, they're offering financing support also. So I know that sounds like a lot of cooks in the, in the kitchen, but everyone has pretty well-defined roles and responsibilities, so in practice, it actually works exactly as we hoped it would to advance the project to keep it moving forward. So then that gets to the transit-oriented development. So um, again, and Al had mentioned this, the RDA, we are not a transit agency, but the responsibility for TOD does lie with my agency, the Regional Development Authority. NICD, the rail, op the rail operator, they're responsible for uh, the current construction of the projects and the ongoing operations and maintenance of the South Shoreline. RDA, we take the lead when it comes to planning and then the establishing the establishment of the transit development districts, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, and also the um, putting the funding development together. So that said, you know, the RDA, we're not, we're not a dictator in this process. We know that doesn't work. So any development that we do, it really does have to be a balance between the RDA and the communities that we serve. And RDA uh, can fund projects, but the communities, they still, they still keep their local control over things like zoning and permitting. So in order for any project to really move ahead, we have to be uh, in agreement. So, um, and then when we, when RDA, when we actually start to get to the joint development uh, at the stations, we do anticipate that, by the way, with several of our communities, um, many, of, a bunch of them are already talking about structured parking. So everyone will be at the table when it comes to those sorts of discussions to move it along, the community's RDA and of course the, the rail operator. So how did we get everyone to buy in? Um, you know, I'll be honest, it, uh, it wasn't always easy to convince people. Uh, to um, be comfortable with this given the cost of it and the big change that was going to be occurring in Northwest Indiana that had never been uh, done before. But when we ran the numbers that return on investment, it was just, it was so hard to ignore. We were talking about thousands of new jobs being created, um, new residents. We had projected and still do $2.7 billion in new development over the next uh, couple decades. So that of course meant growing local and tax revenues. So, um, uh, and it really just meant more benefits to the state and to the region too. So the state of Indiana, I think that's kind of moved the needle. They, they really liked the idea of that tax revenue growth. Uh, enough that they wanted to accelerate it as much as possible. They didn't want to wait the two decades if they didn't have to. Thus was born the transit development districts. So these are a form of, um, probably the best way to describe it is a supercharged TIF district, a tax increment financing district. It's designed to incentivize and to promote development at near our South Shore stations 
Once it's established, uh, so it'll generate incremental local property and income tax growth, and that's gonna be funneled through the RDA, through my organization. We can then use those funds for, I mean, a variety of things. The sky's the limit, there's a few restrictions, but it's really to support the development that our communities want to see, that quality development. So, so far we have established 10 transit development districts, and that is in eight communities across four counties. So now we added two more counties that the RDA uh, is working with now that we serve. So I just wanted to give you all an example on what a TDD looks like. This is an established one. It's the Hammond Gateway District. And so this one, and it has to include the station, by the way. So this is where the existing line and the new Westlake corridor come together. That's the new line. The station itself is, if you can see that, it's the white dot at the top of the pink area. So this district, like many of our, of our others, is actually drawn to facilitate both traditional transit-oriented development, meaning development at the, at the station itself, as well as to support the city of Hammond's downtown revitalization plans. So you have sites, if you can see it, like A and C near the station, and then the big purple area, which is to the south, and that's actually capturing all their new residential devel development happening right now in, in downtown Hammond. So Hammond's actually been uh, pretty proactive when it comes to planning for the rail expansion and they even have built, they have building an additional station, so a third one, they're getting two new ones, and then a third one in their downtown area, and that's, that's at their own expense. And so I, I'll, I'll start wrapping up with this. So where are we at? What, what's the result of all of this? Well, <clears throat> if you thought earlier when I said 2.7 billion in development sounded ambitious, we actually have uh, more than half of a billion dollars worth of projects occurring right now, turning dirt, not planned, not just announced, actual projects under construction in those transit development districts that have just recently been, been established. That is without a penny of our uh, TDD money. Those have just been established. They take a while to generate revenue. And I may not have mentioned this before, our rail projects are still under construction. Uh, one is, uh, will be finished in the spring of next year, and then the other one um, a year after that. So that, that's why we're confident that our economic projections uh, are probably low and that this commuter rail expansion is really going to be more transformative than any one of us could have ever have imagined. So I'll leave you with this. It's our website. Please go to it, nwitdd.com. It has a bunch of information, more than I could squeeze in our time allotted here. Um, but I want to thank you all for attending this session. Um, and I will end it there and turn it over to Shannon. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I needed to do a time check there because I think we're running a little behind. So I'm going to go um, try to go through uh, as quickly as possible and cover some of the kind of the key points that we wanted. I wanted to, to um, touch base on, and I realized that um, in thinking about the audience and you know to Jack's point, what what is our what is the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure? And what does that look like? I realized that. There's probably folks in the room that doesn't that don't know where British Columbia is. Um, so we're Canada. We're the farthest, most like westernmost uh, province in Canada. And I, I want to. I know that there are some uh, British Columbians in the room. Does anybody have um, an idea of the population? Pop quiz. Just give them a, an idea. Alex, I'm looking at you. No idea. Fans. What's that? Okay, so that's just to give you a bit of an idea. Vancouver is our largest kind of metropolitan area um, with a population of around 3 million. So that, that kind of southern part of our province is, is really the densest. And, and so that gives you a bit of an idea, visual, uh, hopefully in your mind, where we are. Um, so the ministry that I work for um, is, would be equivalent to your DOT. So we're the provincial agency responsible for 
transportation and infrastructure, so that's all of our highways, um, as well as our other infrastructure components, so transit um, and our ferry system. Um, I wanted to kind of show you a little bit about how BC Transit and TransLink interface. So TransLink is its own entity and it is responsible, it's the transit agency for the Vancouver metro area. BC Transit is the rest of the province and that's all bus type of infrastructure. And BC Transit is a crown, so a little more direct relationship with us than, than TransLink has, although our minister is also the minister responsible. Um, and then internally, um, I didn't put it on here because it's often kind of confusing, but there's um, the BC Transportation Financing Authority is a crown under, um, under MADI. And that entity um, is the entity that actually owns all the infrastructure and all the land. And that's important for how we, when we get to kind of talking a little bit more about who does what. Um, and so that includes our transit infrastructure, all of our highways, all of our properties, ferry terminals, etc. And then our deputy minister um, is my boss and my group is integrated development. Um, integrated development because um, we are responsible ultimately for all types of real estate integrated development, including things like ferry oriented development. Um, and highway adjacent development, but TOD is kind of the, the, the biggest, loudest thing going on right now, so we don't even have time to look at that, although I'm very excited about ferry-oriented development. So how it started, um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the BCTFA owns, about, uh, owns our portfolio of properties. They, we have about 5,000 properties. And we were responsible for um, generating revenue by the disposition of those properties. Um, in Canada, and particularly in, in Western Canada, we have a very we we have um, very close relationships with our First Nations. Um, many of them are not treaty nations, meaning they still have land rights. Um, and so we started to change our um, uh, our process of of consultation with the nations as we move to a more open reconciliatory kind of approach and what that happened is is that uh, it changed it put like a leg and installed out our ability to dispose of our assets and so that was frustrating but then I looked I came into government right about that time and I thought that was a great opportunity to rethink how we think about our land assets and that we really should be retaining ownership because our land, as you can imagine, is along these corridors. And um, if you look at London 1500, you know, the corridors are the same then as they are now. The types of transit ha transportation have, has changed. So why would we be selling land? Should we not just be holding on to that land, using it in the meantime, um, and, and, and think about ac economic generation from a different perspective, just as opposed to just selling it off? Um, and so there's, there was a lot of um, interest in doing that and maintaining the ownership and thinking differently about our land. Um, and uh, obviously TOD came from that. And um, what we did in 2023, 2022 and 23, um, is we made some legislative changes. So Bill 16 was 2022. That bill uh, enabled us to be able to acquire land to facilitate transit-oriented development, and I'll speak to a little more detail on that. Um, in t er the earlier this year, we were allocated um, about 700 million uh, for property acquisition plus, plus um, money for operations. Um, and then we've also been active, and I, I feel safe to share this now because it's dropping tomorrow in the, le in, in the legislature, uh, which is, um, Changes to our local planning, local area planning rule, rules where uh, transit-oriented areas will be defined, um, 800 meters from sky trains, 400 meters from bus exchanges, and within those areas, the minimum amount of density will increase. Um, so that'll be pr provincial kind of oversight and directive um, to the municipalities. Um, and then parking requirements will change. So there'll be no parking required um, in those TOD areas. So all those things together kind of are creating this kind of perfect storm for TOD development. Um, Bill 16 
uh, was really an elegant piece of, of um, legislation, actually. And as complicated as it is, it was, it was, it's quite simple. We did it in a fairly simple way. Um, and this is the BCTFA, um, so that, that this is the purpose of that authority. And the purpose of that has always been, as I mentioned, to, to acquire, construct, and do all the things for highways and transit. Uh, what we added was simply that its new, one of its new purposes was um, transit-oriented development. And then with that came all of the powers, capacity, and immunities um, that the province has for highways, transit, et cetera, including expropriation. Um, and I think you call it something different here. Um, but it's basically, it, you, you're, if we need the property, we'll take the property at fair market value. Um, it's not that simple, and I'm, I'm sure it's not for you either. Um, Transit-oriented development, uh, although we can expropriate for TOD, we have, have uh, not gone there yet. Um, and I won't go deeply into the public policy objectives, but um, suffice to say that, you know, all the things you're seeing um, changing in our legislation, so our ability to acquire land, our ability to facilitate TOD, uh, these new changes coming to the Local Government Act, so where they have to provide de developers with the opportunity to build higher and denser, no parking. All of those things are to, to align our public policy objectives, which is, um, has a lot to do with the investments, the billions of dollars that we invest in these systems. And um, as for many uh, communities, I think around the world, around in North America, at least, we're all facing some sort of housing crisis um, and uh, affordable housing and, and a variety of housing types and tenure. So that's another policy objective that we're trying to consider here. Um, we're very keen on active transportation um, and have quite advanced policy and programs for, for including active transportation in our transit um, projects. Um, and um, yeah, so, the, so that is kind of all the kind of policy, legislative kind of things that are happening. Um, a lot of the, uh, there is kind of, you know, this discussion I hear often is why is, why is the Mahdi or your, the DOT equivalent um, buying land and activating TOD? Well, the province is the one that is delivering on these massive transit investments, right? So we have another crown that actually delivers these big projects, like million, billion dollar infrastructure projects. So as part of that, we're buying land. So how it used to work was we would buy just the amount of land we needed to facilitate track and train. Um, and then, you know, we would leave these horrible remnant parcels around stations that could never be activated, you know, leading to things like, you know, like uh, homelessness and, and other issues. So because we are already buying the land, it made sense that we were the ones that would just buy more land to, to facilitate TOD. And because we have done that in the past, we have, um, we have a lot of property already and we have um, significant land holdings around uh, key station sites already. Um, so, so that's kind of the province and Mahdi setting um, the policy direction being the landowner, making the transit investments, along with, uh, with federal counterparts and local counterparts. The transit agencies operate um, the, the transit systems and do also have a landowning uh, component, uh, although TransLink more than BC Transit. Um, local government, so we, we do work, I mean, although we have kind of imposed these new policies, land use policies on them, we still work in a very collaborative uh, way with them because uh, they are ultimately responsible for approvals. And then the developer development community um, is responsible for delivering the vertical product. So Mahdi is not a vertical developer. Um, um, as I was saying, we have a substantial portfolio of properties. A lot of those are those awkward remnants. So we say 5,000, it sounds more impressive than it is. Um, however, we have identified that about 200 properties have TOD potential, which is fairly significant. Um, and as I said, we do have a lot of park and rides across Metro and the rest of the province. So we actually have projects underway at those locations, um, roughly three billion in project value just at a few sites, um, five, six sites. Um, 
I'm going to skip through this. This is just kind of, you know, how we're moving things forward. Uh, you know, I think it's fairly similar to, you know, this a, a collaborative approach with multiple stakeholders, um, ultimately ending with agreements um, with, the, um, with the development community um, to deliver the types of projects that we want. So I'll speak to this and you'll understand some of the prior slides I, I didn't touch on, touch on. So this is a good example of a TOD um, project that we're working on that was a, a park and ride adjacent to um, a, a station site. Um, and so what we're doing is basically taking uh, the property, acquiring more property. Um, there is about a 500% increase in the in the land value of the property that we originally purchased. So with that land value increase and f with getting more density, et cetera, we're able to deliver 100% um, of affordable housing within this development. Uh, we're also delivering, uh, I think our number's up to 90, I think it's going up, 90 childcare spots. Um, and then the other uh, interesting kind of piece that we work on with the province is we're able to work with our other uh, provincial agencies. So Ministry of Education, Ministry of Advanced Education, Citizen Services, which is all of our government offices, um, and JEDI, I love that name, JEDI, that, but they are like the Jobs and Economic Development. Uh, we work with them to find opportunities for co-location opportunities for within our TODs, and there will likely be some sort of more direction, directive direction given to the ministries to work with us to land a lot of their facilities in TODs first. So that means um, vertical schools, um, uh, second post-sec uh, campuses, you know, they're, they're regionalizing their models. Um, ed health facilities, obviously key. Childcare is a no-brainer. And then all, um, government offices, as we're all shifting, they're working on a big master plan right now for how to, how to kind of think about our workspace. And it's all coming down to these smaller nodes in more frequent locations. Um, yeah, and this one was a unique one. It, it was, uh, it's a 15 acre property. There's multiple developers on this site. We actually did a master plan with all the developers together. And now we're going through phase one where two developers have um, already started their rezoning and we're going forward with our rezoning this December um, with the municipality, even though we may not always have to do that kind of rezoning because we're um, a higher authority. Um, we do want to have that kind of collaborative approach with the local government. I'm just going to show you one more time. We, we okay? Um, and then th this is like the, the other kind of key thing is, is really shifting to an integrated approach, particularly on new um, investments and new projects. Um, so we're holding on to our land, we're leveraging our, our assets, um, the, we're aligning with the feds um, as well and obviously with the province um, on these new infra infrastructure projects and thinking about um, how we deliver for the future. Uh, we're also seeing our federal counterparts moving in the direction of funding that is going to be uh, transit funding that will be aligned with housing requirements. So they're actually going to say that if in, uh, in order for us to get funding for transit investment and transit projects, uh, we got to deliver housing. So all the, the stars are aligning to support the, the work that we've done uh, in, in the province of BC, which is, I think, fair to say, quite uh, more advanced than any of the other um, the, some of the other provinces um, in, in Canada. Um, not Ontario, Ontario's been doing this too. Um, and then the, the major kind of, our major infrastructure projects, when we think about these, we're going out really early, well, I'd like to go out even earlier, but as early as possible to get the land we need, not just for the head houses, but for um, the lay down areas, construction lay down areas, where those will all become uh, phase two and three of TOD over time. Um, with transit-oriented development integrated right into the building. Obviously, this is the example here is a fairly dense um, SkyTrain subway um, system in Metro. Um, so that was fully overbuilt um, integrated approach. On some of the other projects that we have going on in some of the uh, more um, suburban locations, we're doing highway, we're doing uh, station adjacent development, and in some cases linking into the station site or at minimum having the ground plane plaza as kind of the integration location. Um, 
and um, yeah, and, and just like sh that sh really shifting to how we think about building these these new systems and thinking of infrastructure as being part, like TOD as being part of infrastructure, a requirement to these initiatives. So I'm gonna leave it there because I know that um, my, my new friend Al here wants to ask some questions. So I think I kept to my time, almost. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Here we go. All right, well, in the interest of having time for your questions, uh, we're gonna abbreviate our panel discussion, and I wanna ask the panelists two questions. And you've heard a lot of very important technical information. Uh, I'm gonna ask two relatively non-technical questions um, of, of, of each of us. Uh, let me begin by summarizing what I hope was the, the takeaway from, from, each, from what each of us had to say. Um, in the case of DOT, uh, Jack's agency, you heard about a, a conscious strategy of partnering with host municipalities to take advantage of their superior ability uh, to, to, to do development uh, and to integrate entitlement and all the stuff they do with the actual disposition of the land in partnership with DOT and, and, and I assume also, Jack, the ability, uh, I, I know because I know of some cases, where you own land, the municipality owns land next door, and you're able to actually combine it into a, among the other benefits, combine it into a big project. In the case of the MBTA, I described over a long period of time uh, an ability to partner with other local government jurisdictions, uh, those who control either the ownership or entitlement of land to bring them into the deal or put the MBTA into their deal in order to do things that the T could never have done legally or politically on its own. In Northwest Indiana, you've got this unusual situation of a regional rail authority, NICTI, and a regional development authority, IDA, Sherry's agency, joined together uh, in their enabling acts. In fact, Sherry, you have the, not only the ability, you act uh, as their financial agent for the actual rail project, as well as having this extraordinary set of, of state-enabled regional powers to do TOD, and I view it in my definition as an example of joint development because of the close institutional relationship between the two. And, and in British Columbia, you have a situation where the, 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 the agency that runs, you know, if, if you go to Vancouver and ride the system, uh, you see TransLink, the regional transit authority, which, which Shannon described as, as, as the owner in the face of, of transit. Uh, their ability between limited land ownership and, and, and other limitations to do a lot of TOD around that system, but to do joint development in which the transit interest is part of the deal itself was very limited, and the legislature gave the ministry, the equivalent of our state DOTs, not only the ability and the mandate to do that, but an extraordinary set of powers. You know, the use of eminent domain to acquire land and to dispose of land, to discount the price of land, to achieve development objectives. So, that's, that's what I take as the takeaway from each of these. And I wanna ask each of you um, two non-technical questions. The first is, how is this gone? Um, you've got these partnerships, you're each working with host municipalities. Uh, in the case of Sherry and Shannon, you're dealing with the counterpart rail operating agencies as well as host municipalities, and you're doing things that typically um, uh, are, are just done at the municipal level historically, I would say, in both countries. So how, how is this gone? Uh, how's it working in terms of the culture of you and your partners? Uh, How's, how's it going? <laughs> well, for us, I think it's gone real well. Uh, the only thing that hasn't happened is, I think the, the, the two suburban members who came to us on the ILAs thinking they could speed up the process found out just how lengthy the process is and how bureaucratic it is and transparency is so important. And when you bring in two bureaucracies, you've got the city and DART, you've sort of doubled up. 
And what we've tried to do is expedite that by partnering. But I think all the cities right now, um, Garland, Addison, Richardson, Carrollton, and the city of Dallas in particular with what we're doing with them with this new, new concept of doing six sites, and that's just DART property. There's no city property in that. I think all the cities have been happy at, at, at the way it's gone so far. Chuck? This is, this is a great question, and I would answer it that it's a mixture of smooth and rocky, and it just depends on you know what initiative we were going after uh, at the time. So in terms of the rail expansion, that started off quite rocky. Uh, the RDA led that effort, not the rail operator. So I think that was confusing to a lot of folks in our community. We were trying to put together the capital stack. We uh, were very close with our congressman and um, we were strongly urged to go after this. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So we did and um, people I uh, thought we were uh, crazy for doing that, but we still went ahead and did it. And we tried to garner all of the support and we're talking on many different levels of government. And not only that, but we're asking for financial support to um, fund this very large project, $1.5 billion. And not everybody was on board. It took a lot of convincing um, and we focused on the benefits of it, and eventually folks got on board, um, but when it transitioned to the transit-oriented development, there, there was a part there where Northwest Indiana didn't really know what that meant. The state of Indiana didn't know what it, I mean, that's how far behind we were. They didn't know what it meant. You know, they thought it meant that we were gonna take people's homes away from them. So there was a lot of education and a lot of growing pains. Uh, we, we, got over that, we got over that hurdle. So things are going quite well now and working with our communities has been extraordinary because they are so excited about the their, their development potential. And like I said earlier, our, our projects are still under construction and we have one of the hottest real estate markets that we've ever seen. So, so we got there, but it took over, over a decade to get there. And, and I, I, am I wrong in imagining that one of the reasons that once you're over the hurdle and, and the TDDs have been established uh, where they have been, um, that from the municipality standpoint, you know, not only do they control zoning and land use and all that, and you know, you get you get past all that, but the the improvements that the TDD proceeds, the tax increment proceeds, will be able to pay for are things that either the development or the transit project or the municipality would have to pay for otherwise. And absent those improvements, and it's sidewalks and other stuff, absent those improvements, the the development from which you know, Nikki gets riders and the municipalities get tax revenues, wouldn't happen. Yeah, it, it offsets that cost that would otherwise be borne onto the communities. So the communities have been our biggest champions now. So they're out there saying, yeah, you know, we're gonna be able to get the funding once the revenue starts to grow and the sky's pretty much the limit, like I said earlier, some restrictions on what they can't use it for, but for the most part, it, what it's going to allow them to do is be more proactive when it comes to the development instead of um, reactive as they may have been in the past. And they may have been happy with, you know, any developer coming in, wanting to put any development in, that they would, you know, pretty much do anything just to land that deal. But now they have this, this economic development tool that they haven't had before. So what it does is it really gives them uh, a seat at the table to really negotiate. And, and they can turn, they have been turning away development. So that's, it's just a different conversation that our communities are having. They get to really look at that quality development that they've been wanting for a very long time. And now they have the tools to do it. And Shannon, uh, your, your, uh, your power is to do all this stuff of brand new. How's, how's it going over? Well, it's polling well, so the politicians are very happy. Um, the, uh, the development community has been really supportive. Um, you know, we're able to, as a senior level of government, we're able to de-risk these projects very significantly and embed things into them like the affordable housing components, leased space, um, you know, pre-leased with government offices, stable, you know, uh, health education. Uh, so those are making really big um, um, impacts. 
when we get to the table with the municipalities and, and get through kind of the zoning pieces. Um, I think it's also like we're in a very, um, we are in a uh, definitely in a housing crisis. Um, we're also on the backside of a market and interest rates are very high. Um, land costs are incredibly expensive in Metro and in the capital region of BC. Um, and so with the money that we have, we've, we're actually able, like, we're actually able to buy some pieces of property, like some properties that would be, wouldn't even see the day, light of day to get to the market normally. They'd be snatched up. So there's advantages to that as well. And that gives us some, some opportunity to, for future development on, on some of the future, uh, future sites. Um, yeah, I think, and yeah, overall, I think it's, it's going well at this point. Good. I'm going to ask one more question, and we're all going to answer very briefly, and that is, the, to what degree do, do you feel, or, or, or do you feel like a broader set of stakeholders uh, in your region feels, that the, that, that, that the TOD joint development projects that are coming out of uh, these, these processes and partnerships have the ability, either are now, which I doubt, um, or, or, or aspirationally are seen as having the ability to be transformative, not just that the, a particular project is a big project, but to, to begin to change the land use map, change transportation behavior uh, in a, in a, in a pro-transit way in a particular district or a particular corridor. And just, you know, an answer briefly, is that, are people feeling that or not yet, or? Uh, for the DART service area, that's the reason the cities are interested in it. It's all about being transformative versus, you know, big vacant parking lot. So. Yeah, I mean, when we were selling the rail projects, we promised that this would be a transformative change and they couldn't, you know, it was hard to get that message across at times because you couldn't see it, but now that the rail projects are mostly underway in construction and that development's coming in before the uh, rail projects have even been completed, that momentum is there. So I would say that um, people are, they remain very excited about it and, uh, you know, they are looking forward into the future and saying, you know, how much more transformative can this be? So, Shannon? Yeah, I'd say the expectations are, are high um, for, for this level of transformation, um, particularly around um, Metro Van and M Metro Vancouver, um, and what we're bringing to the table in terms of integrated planning, um, active transportation, and embedding public policy objectives into these projects. Where you are, where everyone is kind of used to seeing those luxury condos with two uh, parking stalls down below, and those folks are not the ones riding transit. The expectation is that we're changing the demographics of who's able to live in metro affordably around transit. I think that's probably one of the most exciting things. Great, thank you all. Uh, we uh, we have time for and very much want uh, questions from the audience. Um, I am absolutely blinded by the light. Is, is, is there a microphone there? Am I, am I looking at a microphone stand in front? Great. Um, uh, if, you can, if you can shout from your seat, fine. If you want to come up to the microphone, please do. Uh, but we, 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 have, we have time for some questions. And um, f fire away and uh, either come up or jump up and down so we see you. Yes. So the state legislature, when they first created the RDA, they didn't have um, anything with TOD in there. But once we moved forward with the rail projects in 2018, that's how they developed the transit development districts. So that incremental property tax and the local option income tax, those dollars come to the RDA and then the state benefits from the 
uh, revenue from the sales tax. So they haven't yet begun to, um, they've been established, so we've established our base year, so it's gonna take a little bit of time for that to accumulate, so we can then use it for bonding purposes later on once we're ready to work with the communities on a um, joint development deal. I decided to do this the old-fashioned way and come out on the floor with a mic. Other questions? Hi, it's Joe Clemens. Um, Jack, this is a question for you uh, related to the city of Dallas. I'm interested in how they're thinking about workforce housing as part of those sites, the six sites. Well, particularly in the South, South Dallas, since that is a, a major issue, concern for them is equity in, in Dallas. And I know depends on where you're at in the metro area, but Dallas is definitely, that's one of their goals. Yeah, this was the whole impetus for the six sites. Uh, actually, they want to do a whole lot more than six sites, but um, we have slowed it down because we want to see how this process goes before we get too far out there. But there was a couple of years ago, there was an incentive from council for a thousand affordable units. So that was part of this also. So all of these as part of the RFP uh, have a requirement for affordable housing. Hi, this is a, whoa, whoa. Uh, Peter, Peter Mullen from Austin Transit Partnership. So first of all, um, Shannon, the fact you're buying land for the long haul, like amazing. I mean, incredible, um, so jealous. So really this is a question for everybody else in the room. Has anybody else in the United States uh, been able to do that? Because it seems like where we are, there are severe limitations yeah, laughing. So, anyone? Is this, a, is this just a Canadian thing? Because, you know, there are lots of ways in which we wish we were Canada, but um, is this another one of those, or are there examples in the U.S.? Yeah, th there are some examples from the U.S. Um, you know, the, the explicit power to acquire land, in, up to and including, although I gather you haven't done it yet, uh, expropriation, which is what Canadians call eminent domain, for this purpose is, I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. Um, imagine TxDOT. Um, but uh, the idea of integrated project delivery and particularly at a new corridor uh, in the U.S., planning the corridor, planning your right-of-way assembly strategy for, you know, for surface parking, for construction lay down in a way that's intentional about the future joint development opportunity. That, that idea is, is out there now. Uh, Sound Transit for one uh, is, is, is very much thinking about that and, 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 I, and I believe doing it. Um, you know, everybody's constrained by their own enabling act and uh, you know, you, you're constrained by what FTA will let you buy land for, assuming it's a federally assisted project. But you know, within, within common sense limitations, you can do that and there's some encouragement to do it but it's, it's kind of a new thing. Uh, you know, all of us grew up uh, with, with engine, you know, right away engineering departments who would figure out how to cut the corner off an old strip mall, you know, to make, to make sure they didn't have to actually acquire it next to a brand new station. I'd, I'd also just uh, add, um, it was an interesting question because before this session, I came up with a list of all the things a transit agency can't do. So, uh, Nobody's gotten to all of them yet, so. <laughs> Great presentation, everyone. Um, question actually is for Jack. So uh, you're dealing with parking lots. Uh, obviously, things have changed since COVID. Um, my question is maybe a two-part question. Um, what kind of hoops um, are you having to jump through? Uh, are these federalized uh, properties? You're gonna have to redo ridership models, or um, is the calculus that with transit-oriented development, you're gonna increase uh, ridership. So what, what kind of process are you going through there? We're focused on the latter. Um, we're, we're just going in that direction because we've got such an inventory that we can show even before COVID, these parking lots were underutilized. Now we're not getting rid of all the parking, we're just getting it to realistic. Uh, and it all goes back and uh, you know, how these 
parking requirements were developed in the first place for transit, particularly for rail stations, you know, it just, it's a product of the regional model. And I tell people, I was in many meetings back in the 90s with the cities who, they said the regional model showed a demand for 200 spaces. Okay, make it 400. And, and kiss and ride would be six. Okay, make it 13. So, you know, they all are fairly arbitrary. The one thing is now that all the cities are looking at reducing. And, and actually, there's been a lot of this in discussions the last couple of days. But the issue is not the city parking requirements. It's the lenders. The lenders are the ones that are pushing developers. And for some reason, developers just fold up. Developers set, or a lender says, this is what you need. They go, yes. I've asked them to include parking or dart passes for uh, transit as part of their apartment elements and things like that. And they look at me like I'm a blathering idiot. It was like, well, we're not spending money on that. So. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, Vance Harris with Dialogue. Uh, these are some of the most complicated, difficult projects ever. Um, and I agree that they're transformational. The question is, how within your groups do you, after the first wins start coming in, as they are and, and inevitably will be, uh, how do you bake in that culture of innovation to your teams or your departments so that, you know, the, the bar is always high uh, and, and extends beyond the first wins. Uh, and that's not to take anything away from these first wins, but like, how do you enshrine this culture that you've actually started to create, maybe unintentionally, um, but I think the culture is a real thing that, that you do need to focus on? Well, uh, for us, it, it's nice having the couch here because it's sort of like therapy up here, but uh, for us, it's just, you just, it's education and you just beat on it. You know, when we, before we opened rail, even the developers said no way anybody would ever want to develop near a rail station. That's just, this is Dallas, you always heard that. And, and then internally, operations, things like that, uh, it just takes a lot of cooperation. It takes, uh, you know, making sure your bosses are on board. Uh, and our board of directors, more importantly. That's where I go back, always go back to the TOD policy, because that really lines out everything that we're doing, being innovative, using uh, underutilized parking, integrating operations, all of that. And then the last is, I've been there longer than everybody else. Um, yeah, I think for, I really like that question. Um, and. For us, or for me personally, I think the it really comes down to uh, working on your business, not in your business. And that's not very uh, well received in government. And so I think for us to be innovative, we got to think innovatively and act innov innovatively, particularly um, within this challenging kind of confine of government. So although it sounds like we're very progressive, and we, we probably are in some things, some things we're not, and that is what will kill this program if we can't um, be, like to create that culture and really demonstrate why it's of value. Um, so coming to conferences, seeing what other people are doing, um, because I think it's going to, although it sounds innovative now, tomorrow it's just like, yeah, this is the expectation. We should be doing TOD like this all the time. So where's the, where does, the culture and the innovation come from after that. So. More questions? Anyone else? All right, I want to thank the panel so much. Um, let's have a round of applause and then I want to say something else. An extraordinary group. The presentations are great. Thank you all. And I, and I thought both our our panel discussion and uh, and the response to the questions was was in, uh, informative uh, for all of us. Um, I just want to go back to the point of the session. Uh, joint development 
among, it, it's, it's a subset of TOD that enables the transit interest, whether it's the transit agency or some other agency standing for the transit interest. With joint development, you not only get to grow ridership and reap the benefits of the fare box, but you get to be in some kind of business deal that gets you money or in-kind contributions, some, some value you wouldn't have got if somebody was doing the same development across the street and you're not involved. And it gives you the ability to set the standard. This is the kind of TOD we want around here. This is the density. This is the sense of, of activation and, and, and mixed use and walkability and all the rest of it and, and, and move the needle on, on, on the land use map and on, and on, and on behavior uh, because people see something great and all that land around you that, in which you don't have an interest uh, can in the fullness of time follow that example. And, you know, these are, you know, the, these, these examples, uh, you know, all, all of this, I mean, we're still, we're, we're, we're still in the early era uh, of, 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 of modern uh, TOD and, and joint development, but you can see this idea, you can see the idea that, that the public sees catching on. They don't care about all the jurisdictional stuff. Our point here today was, was to give you all the sense that what we traditionally think of when somebody says joint development in our industry, which is development on surplus transit agency land, and again, a lot of it is that, but it's not just that that when you look and figure out ways to involve other agencies, other jurisdictions, or as in the case of some of the MBTA things I told you about, they come to you and say, if you're willing to do X, Y, and Z, then you can be in this deal. That kaleidoscopically opens up how the transit interest can actually be in real estate transactions or at least get the direct benefit of them, and it really kind of changes the game for how the transit interest can grow ridership, get valuable contributions along the way, and set the example that they want. So thank you all very much for attending. Have a nice evening and panel. Thank you again.